So my name's Patricia McFadden, and um, the title of my lecture is Contemporary African Feminism, Revolutionary Struggles for Alternative Societies. And I'm hoping that when I look at the body language, <laughs> Maybe I'll see a bit more uh, of some, some relaxation by the end of the lecture. <laughs> ah, for those of you who are really uncomfortable, just relax. It's new knowledge. You don't have to become a feminist. The intentions of this lecture, which I've already uh, entered into, by analyzing the emergence of contemporary African feminism and its links and interrelationships to uh, nationalism, anti-colonialism, and anti-patriarchal resistance. So these are the three blocks that I'm going to be speaking to, okay? Um, and these engagements with these three large notions and practices uh, are, are f f fundamentally connected to women's resistance and women's struggles for freedom and dignity, okay? So people struggle because they have an intention. And when you have equality, democracy, fairness, justice, people don't struggle. Because everybody wants a life of dignity, all right? But when you have deep embedded inequalities in a society, whether they're class society, they're class inequalities or racial or gendered, gendered inequalities or ability, uh, inequalities that are linked with ability, the assumption that, you know, because I'm born unseeing, therefore I'm less, um, or because I make an alternative sexual choice to the normative heterosexual uh, uh, um, uh, identities and practices that therefore I'm different and I'm other, then people struggle. And the whole purpose of struggle is to reinstitute in our social spaces, in our lives, harmony, fairness, justice, to be able to live like a, a full human being, you see. And then you can use all your gifts, your creative gifts, whatever it is that you're best at, you can bring those to the society to enhance the society. But if there's inequality, if there's repression and oppression, you can't do that, you see. Because you're preoccupied with those things that exclude you, those things that make you less, those things that are used to suppress you, to silence you, and to constrain you. So the purpose of this lecture is really to speak to the systems, the factors, you know, the historical forces that have defined women in particular ways and constrained women and therefore denied women equality, justice, freedom, and dignity, All right? And I want to begin by arguing, and I can prove it historically, that patriarchy, the system that provides males with institutionalized power, privilege, and also allows them to exercise violence, impunity, OK? and all the other egregious practices that males practice on women and on younger humans who are called children, all right? These are just younger humans, you know? <laughs> they do become adults, older, eventually, and can defend themselves, but they start, you know, being young. And patriarchy institutionalizes the systems of power that allow males to dominate everybody else, okay? 
eventually young males can look forward to being dominators too, but not young females. All right? So patriarchy is African and it's universal. This is really important because most people who resist feminism, who claim that feminism is Western, that is something that the whites brought to Africa, that African women who are feminists are copying white women, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Really lame stuff, OK? Don't actually understand that patriarchy as a system of privilege, which translates not only from the, in the lives of men, but also into class privilege. It translates into racial privilege. It translates into all the other systems of privileging, you know, that we take for granted. Patriarchy begins in Africa. That system is associated with the oldest human societies. So the next time you claim, which you should do, that we, the Africans, we created the first organized systematic human societies. We did. Because humans evolved, unless you are religious, of course, and a Christian or a, a Muslim, and you believe that humans dropped from the sky into a garden somewhere, and then after that, you know, the journey begins. We can agree on that, too. Where you want to start is your choice. But taking the first step, all of us do. OK? So we're not going to have any contention about that, I hope. Whether you start in the Garden of Eden or you start from the cell, which is where I start, and the evolutionary process, OK? <laughs> I know I'm destabilizing some people, but it's OK. I'm not saying you should believe what I'm saying. I'm just telling you that that's where I locate myself, all right? But humans spread out across the world from this continent. And the recent discoveries of humans who've been lying in the, in the belly of, the, of Mother Earth, and let me call her Mother Earth, <laughs> even though there are feminists who would come for me um, on that one, because feminizing the Earth is also deeply problematical. And I, 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 if, I don't say, if I don't explain it, you must remind me, because I have, I have a point where I'm going to show you why it's so problematical. But it just sounds nice, you know. It just sounds good to say Mother Earth. Because look at this planet, how powerful she is. Huh? Whoops, I made it. I did it again. <laughs> now, what I'm doing is I'm showing you how we learn languages that are gendered and that reflect the ways in which humans have constructed even material spaces, forms of matter, and we feminize them. You see? And in doing that, of course, we create the possibilities to constrain women when we say women are naturally mothers because nature and the earth is natural. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So discourses are very powerful. And the languages that are used to engage and to narrate discourses are also very powerful. And you have to really think about what language are you using to say something? So my argument is that because on this continent we began the human journey, we also have the oldest expressions of patriarchy. And these expressions of patriarchy can be found in the persistence of feudalism. Feudalism. Your chiefs, they are feudalists. That dictatorship I was telling you about in that small little country next door is feudal. And in fact, if you look at the rest of the world, most of the feudal systems have dissipated. But here, we have exoticized feudalism, all right? We hold on to it. And for most human beings on this continent, feudalism doesn't function 
in ways that are enhancing for democracy, for mobility, because most of the human beings are females. Most of the people who are most affected by feudalism are women and girls. And the rural spaces where feudalism is re-entrenched and re-entrenched, you can see. You know, I mean, uh, well, you know, you all know your own country, right? Literally every corner of this country outside of the cities and the urban spaces is controlled by feudalists. Chiefs. That's a nice way of calling it, you know, of calling feudalism. You call it chiefs. Then you attach a notion of authenticity. Just write it down if it's making you feel uncomfortable. Just